Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to a live edition of the Latest Shining Podcast. Very exciting. We're here in Santa Clara at the uh, SRE Con 18. And with me is Rob Hirschfeld, as usual. Hey, Rob. Steven. Unusual. We look at each other when we do this, so you can't tell all the other things I do we normally record. And we have a really special guest. We have the Chief Product Officer of Honeycomb, Christina Yen, with us. Welcome. Hi. So why don't we, uh, you know, we usually do have our guests kind of introduce themselves, give a little background about yourself, and then maybe tell us a little about Honeycomb, and then we'll kind of dive in. Sounds great. Um, I'm Christine. I'm the co-founder of, um, and chief product officer of Honeycomb. Um, I've been working with developer tools for years. Um, I love building tools to help people um, build the things that they care about better, faster, more accurately, and... Um, I'm now working on Honeycomb. Um, I started Honeycomb with charity in order to help people be able to iteratively explore their service data. Um, essentially, we felt like a lot of the tools out there weren't flexible enough to have helped us debug the sorts of problems that we ran into together um, at Parse and wanted something that was felt modern, felt like it wasn't making trade-offs tools made in 1995. We had grep and we had counters, became distributed grep and ROGs. Um, we're, you know, it's, it's 2010, 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, what can technology help us build today? Makes a lot of sense. And there's a ton of things I want to unpack with that. First, we, we do need to say we, we are recording um, most people who've been in tech know this know this area very well. This, we're behind the bar, so there's a little bit of sound in the Hyatt and at the Santa Clara so, Convention so you can Center. Entirely looking out over the pool, so you can entirely envision this this scene, if you will, at one of the small bar tables. Um, so, um, and what, the other thing that's, that's really exciting is I sat down with with Ben, who's one of your I don't know what, what his title officially He's is. He's an engineer. Chief every everything. Chief everything. Um, yeah, like and, and we sat down and literally did an integration for the Honeycomb system in an hour. To the plus, like we were literally we took the digital rebar, which has a JSON log emitter, we wired that up to Honeycomb with you know, GoLang APIs between both sides, and we were done expo- exposing logs and doing things like that. So. Um, this is one of those fun cases where we're having a conversation, having just, uh, you know, literally, you know, used the product, tried it out, had that sort of onboarding experience. And what the, I, I want to save this sort of at the end, but I want to talk about that onboarding experience and customer and, and sort oh of the boy. customer satisfaction. But first, because yep. I think that's a really important story, too. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about observability and attack and, and, and where where you stand with that. So you, you had mentioned... Making you know, develop your you feel like you're a developer, right? Charity sort of the ops side um, of, of where this goes. What when you say developer tools, what what is a developer tool? What, I mean, what does that category mean to you? Ah, I would consider developer tools to be a broad category of things that help people ship ship software faster. Okay. Um, mm. I think that can, and, and and shipping is itself a broad term, right? I would. Mm. Consider that to be things that help people write code, help people um, deliver code, help people see if that code is actually doing what it needs to. Essentially, uh, all the tools that um, a software engineer, an architect, an ops person, um, anyone in this technical role might use to do their job to improve velocity. But there, there to me, there's a there's a, a not doing harm. Me, and I, I define harm in a funny way. I mean, you're giving me a, a, a look. Um, <laughs> because it's harm to me is, is about teams. It's about helping other people with code you write. It's about making sure that when you write code that it doesn't, doesn't create problems for you later. So I, I think of technical debt as causing harm. And if that, you know, it's not a physical harm. It's sort of a team harm it's, or a customer harm. Can you back into that a little bit? How does, how does, how does the tools from that perspective sort of support you know, improving life um, for the, all the people involved in the product chain? I'm not entirely sure um, what you're asking. I like okay. the idea of, um, of framing, reframing, making, making it easier to do their job as a 
preventing or reducing harm yeah. as a result of doing your job poorly. Um, or not poorly. Or doing your job correctly, yeah. but you know, there's unintended consequences for that. Right. Right. So I guess one of the things about this is, you know, and Ben, ben made a really good point with this, that Honeycomb doesn't do live data output. It does you know, in inspection and reviews and things like that, which is, to me, a difference between observability and monitoring. Um, where where does you know? Can you explain what that difference is? Is that an important component for you? It is an important component, um, and it's a little bit less about live. Uh, frankly, there are a lot of differences between observability and monitoring, um, and there are there are reams of de debates <laughs> on the internet. Um, to in a, in a nutshell, monitoring feels a lot like you have a thing that you're watching for. Right? It's almost like you know, there's there's a there's a five-year-old running around and you're like, I know you're going to stick your hand in the ice cream. I'm going to watch for that. When it happens, I'm going to catch you and I'm going to tell you not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Observability is a little bit more like, all right, this five-year-old, I don't know what it's going to do, okay. but I'd better, I better keep an eye and just, oh, okay. and just see. Um, Cherry likes to use an analogy where doctors, doctors are often a lot like uh, engineers. When you're trying to debug a problem, um, you doctors don't come up to you and say, is your, is your elbow broken? No, your elbow's fine. Um, how's your ankle? Do you, have, do you have a headache? They don't just try to map how you feel to a bunch of past problems. They, they, they start at the top. How are you feeling? What hurts? Okay. What, how does it hurt? What, what have you been doing? Sure. And we, we feel like that is a lot of what captures um, the, the essence of that difference between monitoring and observability. With observability, you don't know what you're looking for. Sometimes you're not even looking for a problem. You're just trying to understand what normal is or what normal behavior for a particular segment of something is. And the, the real time or the, the live streaming of data out um, is almost more partly an implementation uh, difference at our stage, okay. but also uh, with with when you're when you're just watching for has the five year old put their hand in the ice cream yet? Um, you care about just that thing. So it's much easier okay. to say I only care about this giving real time updates on status of the hand. Right. With observability, like you could have a bunch of live signals, but who knows whether they're useful? Well, there's I mean, I, with monitoring systems going back you know decades, there's a lot of noise. People have a tendency to turn them off, stop monitoring things, mm -hmm. and you you really don't know what's important in a system until until you, you've di done the diagnosis. Um, and so that means you know, there's a ton of data that's coming out of systems. Do you feel like you know, just sort of the logs that come out are sufficient, or do people need to go back and think about how to instrument their applications differently based on diagnos diagnostics that you're helping customers with? That actually depends on how happy they are with what they have right now. Okay. Um, and frankly, our thesis is that you never, you never get it right on the first try. So your instrumentation, how you, the, the data that you're capturing on your systems right. should be evolving with your needs. Is there a story or an example you can think of where there's found something or you changed something? Absolutely. So one of the, one of the core tenets um, of, of Honeycomb is that we want you to be able to adjust the schema or add new columns without okay. having to go through some painful migration or, or like manual schema change. And um, I, I can tell you that internally, you know, we, we, dog food heavily, um, all of our API, our API server is very heavily instrumented, but it didn't start that way. Okay. It started with, okay, let's grab top-level HTTP request, uh, request data, um, maybe some metadata around which endpoints it's hitting and which, which machines it's on, um, but let's start there. And as we start investigating things, if we're like, hmm, latency's up, oh, we don't have any, you know, there's a couple different things that might be contributing to that, let's throw those timers in. Okay. And then a couple minutes later, like, throw those timers in, deploy, and then immediately start being able to see, oh, okay, well, latency latency like this, JSON, JSON serialization latency is here, here are these other sub-timers. And that sort of flow really empowered the developer to take charge of what is my code doing in production. Right. And that's the sort of flexibility um, and, and evolution that we want to see. We want to see people... Which is why schema lists is important. Okay. Schema is important. Yeah. And then, sorry, I cut you off. So. No. Um, yeah. It's 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 all about <coughs> start with you know 
the whole premise of, uh, of observability to honeycomb is that we need to be able to ask new questions. And sometimes that new question will rely on some new data. And if we make it easy for it to add that new data, then we also make it easy to ask those new questions. So one of the things I noticed when I was playing around with it is there's a my view and there's a team view. So part of part of the thing that's interesting to me is that this isn't just about you finding information about what's going on. You can actually do a query and then share it. How does that how does that help? Oh boy. Um, this is something that we've only dipped our toe into. We have dreams, we have hopes and dreams. Uh, the official <laughs> the official uh, mission statement, I think, on our honeycomb uh, about page is something about we build better engineers and better teams. Okay. We want to help teams of people be better debuggers, not just individuals. Um, you know, Splunk is a very powerful tool. The fact that you're often in a team, there's that one Splunk expert that crafts everything. It's cool for that one person, uh, but it doesn't help anyone else get better. Um, Charity and Ben have worked together in a number of different companies, and they have this dynamic where Ben loves graphs. He loves data. He loves pulling out and crafting these gorgeous things that, that show visually what's happening. Um, he's very good at it. Charity... It's very good at bookmarking Ben's graphs. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, you know, useful that's skill. Yeah. useful skill. And that's how, and then, you know, she'll, she'll go from there and then she'll, she'll rip off of it and go and find what she wants. Right. But that's how teams work. No one person or an entire team is not going to be good at things. And we want to build tools to make it easy to share that knowledge. To, um, you know, even if, even, if, and even if Ben didn't share something with me or if I didn't share something with Ben, I want to, Honeycomb should make it easy to virtually kind of peek over your shoulder oh man, last week when you were on call, what did you find? What what, what, uh, what did you look into when um, MySQL was doing this work? Oh, oh, you did these, oh, you, you ran these five queries and it, it it showed you that there was a problem here. Oh, I wonder if I did the same thing. So it gives you a place to start. Exactly. If you're not sure, you can go back and see, well, that's what Ben did or Jared Exactly. Right? And that to me is where SRE actually concept we're talking about there are you know SREs tend to de develop specialties in analysis troubleshooting figuring out these problems and so if you can go and say look this is what I found I built a graph go show the developer can you instrument this to collect better data it becomes a collaborative effort Absolutely. Um, which, is, which seems to be where 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 we want to go with observability monitoring ended up feeling sort of as a transom you know, operators monitored systems. It, they, there wasn't much actionable result by the time the monitor, monitors were telling you there were problems. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I almost, frankly, again, as a developer, I almost feel like most monitoring tools or many monitoring tools are aggressively anti-developer. Uh, and by this I mean, if I come to your page or if I look at your tool and all you're talking about is how well you um, can do transforms on CPU utilization across hosts, that's not what I care about. I care about how my code is doing. If you, if, if an ops person comes to me and shakes their finger and says, Christine, CPU is up on a bunch of machines, I'm going to be like, cool. Okay. Right? <laughs> you, know, I, you know, to me, and, and that, that doesn't tell me anything about my code. It doesn't tell me anything about my customers. But if these tools are able to tell an operator or tell a developer who is um, motivated to, to look it up, the tools are able to say, hey, you know, throughput is, uh, request throughput is down and latency is up for um, you know, this swath of customers. I'll be like, oh man, what does this map to in my code? Oh, weird, ooh, I can, I can see the impact on customers, and now I have a clue with which to go back and, and dig into things. And what I was seeing is that you could go even closer than that. You could come in and say, for shopping carts with more than 10 items, I see a higher latency, and, and right, and then, you know, cause what, what I really see, especially because we're talking about CICD pipelines nowadays, and, and much faster dev to prod, and so you could have a situation where a developer says, there's something going on in here, wow, we didn't put any log data, we didn't instrument this, this section, it's now clearly showing a problem, you can add in that instrumentation, and then create a correlation, or, or link things together. Um, that's the dream. That's a big. That's a big difference, right? Because you, you, you know, monitoring systems is like, ah, this is what I build. It's monitoring. Yeah, yeah CPU yeah. utilization. But that's not. You know, it's very hard to, to untangle that that way. Absolutely. We really built Honeycomb because at um, so Charity and I met at Parse, which was you can think of it as a mobile uh, Heroku for mobile. Okay. And we were a startup that got acquired by Facebook in early 2013. At the time of acquisition, we had 60,000 
distinct mobile apps sending us traffic. Wow. <laughs> some of them were doing, some of them were read heavy, some of them were write heavy. Uh, we had a bunch of shared Mongo replica sets, uh, shared Mongo instances. And any one of those apps could be doing something terrible at any point in time. Sometimes it was, it was the app developers doing something terrible, sometimes it was our platform handling something poorly. Um, but before we got to Facebook, it was essentially, it was essentially un, impossible to tease out. Oh, it's this, it's coming from this one source. There's there's this one strain of traffic. All we basically had were our monitoring tools telling us, oh, you know, top level metrics look great. Right. And you know, it breaks down by the by those sixty thousand apps to identify one or the top ten that were experience, experiencing increased latency. Became it was a game changer when we got to Facebook. Uh, being able to you know. The, the classic story that we tell is, before we got there, uh, you know, we were processing some tens of thousands of requests per second and being very proud of ourselves with these dashboards on the wall saying everything was green. And uh, one day, one of the salespeople ran over to Charity and was like, hey, did you know that Disney is trialing on Parse? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they have a small app they're testing out, uh, and they're saying everything is erroring. And Charity was like, nope, 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 my graphs say everything is fine. I don't know what you're talking about. And you can't, you can't do that if Disney's no. trialing your startup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Charity would have to dispatch an engineer, and this engineer would have to add a whole bunch of terrible, like, if app ID is Disney, do this. Right. Um, and after, after you know, and, then, and then you wait for that thing to happen again. And eventually it did, and it took, it took you know, hours, days to track it down. When we got to Facebook... We had access to an internal tool that let us finally do this sort of uh, high cardinality breakdowns, super fine grained filter uh, behavior that Honey can do today. And that's an important lesson. And you know, to me as a developer, you know, thinking through how things break, they don't break uniformly across every request. They break because you're hitting some edge exception or you're hitting one thing in the in, in the middle of the snowstorm. And so being able to track down that path through the code that somebody's hitting and making other people unhappy, right? You could hit a lock in a random place, right? Or just you know, some weird query locked your database or locked a file and something you really didn't expect. And that's, that is very hard to track down in the middle of a living system. Absolutely. And it's impossible to reproduce outside of the living system. So you're, you're stuck. <laughs> yep. Okay. And so this this is the, the big difference between observability. Yeah. Oh, that's a good well, that's cool thing about it. Frankly, you know, when when the world, or like when a typical startup our size had five beefy app servers running everything, um, it's a lot easier to, to to be like, okay, something's happening in this one instance. Um, now we have um, companies our size have fifty hosts and five hundred containers and all these different moving parts. Right? All these you know, microservices are great for developer productivity. It just means that there's a lot more ways things can combine to go wrong, and being able to tease apart. With, between these uh, transient uh, combinations of factors is, is so necessary. Our tools need to be keeping up with our technology. Well, it's an interesting component for people to think about, right? Centralized logging is essential in, in a, this type of distributed containerized environment. So if you don't have a way to aggregate information spread across that environment, then you will never figure out when there's a problem. In a lot of cases, and people say this all the time, it's always worth repeating. If you're dealing with containerized infrastructure, there's a good chance that the container that caused the problem is gone by the time you, you find there's a problem. Um, and there's even no way to say, wait, keep that one around. It's it's gone, gone. Um, so you know, those become, you know, we, we have to change the way we think about logging, about observing, about monitoring. All those things have to be altered so I'd like to ask a question. So what's interesting to me is these cases that you find, are they starting to, do you start to see trends where maybe I, I'll throw in the AI machine learning because I have to, right? So now I can put AI on the top of the blog to attract more people. But but I would assume that you start to watch. <coughs> see, just Sorry. Do, uh, that's the marketing guy in me. But, uh, but just I'm, I'm top thirty six things you need to know about observability. That's right. With so, AI and blockchain. With AI and blockchain. Uh, so oh, is that no. part of this where you start to the system can actually start to learn and 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 see things coming and almost kind of say, I think there may be a problem there. Is that kind of stuff where we're heading? Maybe eventually. Yeah. Um, I 
um, Aaron Schwartz actually did a great talk at Influx Days um, last November, where in which he very politely explains uh, seven different ways anomaly detection is not a thing. Uh-huh. Um, and it's great. I recommend anyone who's curious about anomaly detection as a uh, thing to add to your tool chest today to go check out that talk. I think for our intended purposes, especially with what we're doing with Honeycomb, um, we, you know, we still really fundamentally believe no one knows your application better than the people who write it, mm-hmm. who operate it. And we are very much interested in how can we help people learn from their team? Mm-hmm. Rather than trying to do anomaly detection based on how the data moves, we would rather help guide you uh, in querying your data or looking at your data based on how your, your best debugger does it. Mm-hmm. We would like to analyze query patterns so that if you're new to the team or you're new to tracking down a problem, we can surface things like, hey, you started with this query. People often toss in this breakdown. Mm-hmm. People often go down this, this route. That's a lot more interesting to us than yeah. telling you, hey, hey, there was a spike. Yes, I know there was a spike. I did a load test. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can now quiet down. But your tool is going to help that person guide them. A little bit. That's what we'd like to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've, we've got we've got big hopes and dreams, uh, and I think these, these some of these we're actually gonna we're, we'll finally start hitting the elbow room to execute on this time. Yeah. I, I like one of the things you said about teams having different specialties on it, and I've seen this right. You know, we'll find people who have test expertise who are really good at troubleshooting a problem, and we'll take a tool and then diagnose it, and come back to the developer and say, "Look, look, I found this problem. You know, found this issue," and you know. It's very hard sometimes to get, a, especially a very productive developer. They can they can be very eager to just keep writing code and not go and, and take code that's already in the field and, and exist it. Hopefully, this changes the dialogue where somebody can say, "All right, if I had a little bit of data here, you know, I'd be able to continue to narrow down that scope and create a better team dynamic for it." Because uh, it can it can be sort of toxic for this relationship between um, I'm saying ops instead of SRE <laughs> or test instead of you know. Because what you know, you're right. It's and th- this to me is where the sort of harm, team harm comes in. Gotcha. Is that if, if a developer says, "Yeah, I wrote that code. Go figure it out." You know, you're trying to change this dynamic and say, "Okay, I can add in some more logging. You can go pat on your head. You found something interesting here. Go go do it again." Um, and, and without hopefully without the condescension, <laughs> um, and that's what we're trying to break down with a lot of DevOps Absolutely. and things like that. But um, we like to talk about the second wave of DevOps. Okay. The first wave was teaching ops people to automate their code to, or sorry, automate their processes to write more code. Cool. Te- teach your ops folks to, to dev. Now, the second wave is about teaching your devs to own their code in production, to teaching the devs to operate their code. Um, and the more, that's why I, like, I love what you brought up um, about monitoring tools um, versus visibility tools. And, the fact that you gave me a soapbox to talk about that. <laughs> um, because it's our job, soapboxes. <laughs> we tee up nicely in this podcast. Thank you. Um, the way, the more that we can give developers uh, the, the nouns that they're used to in, the, in these observability tools, the more we empower them to go look stuff up on their own. Um, I, I take a lot of pride in the engineering culture at Honeycomb where we, we don't just... We don't just write code based on hunches or, or hypotheses or what a product manager tells us to do. It's a lot more, oh man, okay, if we I really want to deprecate this thing, who's using it right now? I don't know, we can go check, right? Oh man, I want to write this I want to write this feature like this. Um, this seems like clear, clearly the most useful way to do something. Um, is it the most useful? Who did it impact? What's the blast radius? Let's go see. And there's there's so many signals that can go be fed it back into the development. De- development process from production that this is the world we want to see, right? That, that feedback loop from development process to production and back uh, shouldn't just be in the process of shipping. It should be something that happens at every stage. I, I like what you're saying. To me, this corrects um, one of the assumptions people make when they talk about a full stack engineer. Mm-hmm. We're, we're talking about a developer who owns their code and carries a pager if they own their code into production, that doesn't mean they have to own all of the infrastructure and supporting pieces and things like that. So I, I, I believe we're getting more nuanced in, right? Because if you write code, you should own its, its behavior in production. That doesn't mean that you should own the, the deployment of the servers and the right. platforms and 
monitoring it. And, and, you know, there are a whole bunch of things that you know, are a distraction for a developer mm -hmm. um, and, and not a specialty. They are their own specialties. Absolutely. Um, and, but yet, I feel like your tool is, is helping cut across those things. Mm -hmm. Do you call it a tool or a platform, by the way? Uh, I, think, I, I call it a tool. Okay. Cool. I call it a tool. Um, it's something that people use to build their platforms. Um, and certainly, platforms are ideal customers for us because we've got lots of things going, going on. Um, but yeah, uh, again, I met, but we mentioned this internal tool at Facebook. Um, some of the best engineers we knew at Facebook would spend half half their time writing code and then half their time watching how it behaved. Right? You can deploy something <laughs> and immediately see what's what's going on. Is th this thing that I thought would improve performance is it actually just improving performance? So that's powerful. So. Right, as we as we shorten the cycles, then a, de a developer could actually make a performance change, and then within the day, be checking to see if those changes. Oh, yeah. So it's it's about attention time span. If I made a change to improve performance in a you know a week later, or a month later, you the forgot it by that. You wouldn't even remember that you were tracking that. Um, and you know, it's always a you know crapshoot if you're going to actually get a performance improvement out of changes. Um, and if you're an engineer thinking you know. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so yeah. That, that type of observability is very quick. Cycle time is important. I, I want to transition a little bit because you've been saying something, you've been sort of coming back to startup, figuring this out, that, that process. And um, to me, the, you know, all the observability and the tech is really interesting. There's also a part of listening to users and learning and, and being a startup. You want, can you talk about sort of that journey a little bit? Yeah. Um, Charity and I had the great fortune early on um, to, again, have, have seen a very concrete version of the, the role that we wanted in. Um, and really this meant that for the first year or so, we could, well, I would say for the first like, six months, we could just go heads down. Sure. We could just build. We, we, we knew what the baseline interaction engine we wanted to build was. Um, and this has been a fascinating learning experience about the world and people because when we popped our heads up and we're like, okay, it's time for people to try this out, mm -hmm. um, we, we began to learn how much education there is around how people do things. Um, and we have, uh, I have to say, I have a huge amount of respect now. Like I, I didn't even know what I was <laughs> missing, amount of respect for the sorts of, sort of discovery and, and like learning about customer use cases that is associated with product as well as sales. Um, something that we had to realize early on is we, we can't, we shouldn't just be talking to every software company under the sun, every platform company that's doing something cool. We would have to ask, are you feeling production pain? Are you concerned about reliability? And we had some, cus we, uh, sorry, we had some, some friends or some prospects that we talked to who were like, you know, actually we're really worried about features right now. And that's fine. You know, those are, those are, those are folks who have different priorities, and we would back away and say, "Cool, we're not we're not going to talk to you right now." Um, but the folks who were interested in reliability, the folks who um, who were kind of curious about what we were what we were building, uh, we talked to them constantly. Um, Charity and I um, and Ben come from the school of um, engineers do support. Engineers are on the front line. You know, if if need be, you go in bed with a customer to help them uh, onboard, and so. We, we love hearing what people, we love getting our hands dirty, like Ben did with you yesterday. Uh -huh. um, we love hearing about what the, the problems that people are actually trying to solve. Well, and that's how, that's how you see where somebody's confused, they can't find a button, they, right? Because yeah. I agree with you, right? If, and if an engineer's feeling the pain for a, a feature being hard to write or something not having cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to translate that as a, you know, somebody giving product direction, it's easy for a developer to say, all right, we just should, that should work like that. I'll just go <laughs> fix it. Mm -hmm. um, right. right, that happens to me when I do UX work all the time. It's like, that just, that's just bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like we have both sides of that, where on yeah. one hand, again, uh, sort of being looked at in the same space as a lot of source tools, um, things that tend to get designed by committee, mm. uh, Decently low bar okay. to, to try to to try to just skate above. On the other hand, um, we did do a lot of you know that, at that six month mark. We were like, okay, we're ready. 
people can start using us, and we started bringing people into the office, and they would just stare at the interface. Um, and there's a lot of um, calibration that we had to do. When we first started out, um, again, I, I'm more from the dev side. I spent a lot of time with data tools. And our first iteration of the UI, I was like, oh, you know, this, let's make it look like SQL. Everyone knows SQL <laughs> super well. Everyone knows how to use SQL to do analytics. Um, so let's just say, okay, we'll have an aggregate and a group by and a filter uh, and a where, and people will fill, fill it in and know. Uh, and I just still remember those first few users who came into our office who just sat down and they kind of frowned for a little bit. And they looked at me and they were like, doesn't aggregate and group by mean the same thing? <laughs> I'm an old SQL hack, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, but you know, to to someone on the street or someone who yeah. hasn't spent all their time thinking about aggregate functions, and it it is, yeah, aggregate and group like they're they're the same. Did, did you find you had to differentiate between first users that out of the box experience? Mm -hmm. So how did you what did you do to tune the out of box experience? Oh, we are still constantly tuning this. I would uh, I would give ourselves maybe like a C minus on the out of the box experience right now. Um, and this is something that we are focusing on a lot for this coming this coming year. Um, we are very much still usable for power users right, users right now, um, and we've invested somewhat into kind of an additional. Our Quick Start is very friendly and has a little has a little thing you can play with interactively while you read um, how to use it. Um, we are definitely still very dependent on that first person knowing a little bit about what they're doing, okay. um, knowing a little bit about what they're what they're trying to do and, and being willing to find I'm, our I'm, interface to I'm it. laughing because I just blew past a quick start. I didn't, I just clicked click and dumped <laughs> data. <laughs> you, had, you had been next to you. I did. That was a benefit. Um, and, and, and if I didn't, it would I would have been more lost. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's, I mean, we, we literally stopped a lot of engineering effort and, and focused on usability also. Okay. And it's, can't do it in a vacuum. You have to do it with users. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. it's it's real engineering. Absolutely. Uh, people, the, the the more the further I get in my career, the less I realize. Um, sorry, the more I realize <laughs> the technology doesn't matter. It's not that the technology doesn't matter, but that uh, the hard problems are not technology problems. The hard problems are always people problems. And sometimes those people problems are just how do I get what is in my head into your head? Right. Or how do I make this this something that that, that can survive that transition. Or how do I meet you where you are? Is, is, and that to me is the interesting thing. I think we've talked about this a lot, so I like sort of like having the conversation because there's a lot of about observability and what you're doing with observability that people already want. Yep. And they, they know they, they, they know they want it. They, they're like, ah, if only, and, and they don't realize they can do it. Um, and so to me, part of this challenge is sort of helping you say, oh, you can do it. It's not that hard. Um, we had a lot of conversations early on about um, you know, that, that classic uh, customers are asking for a faster horse. We're building a car. Um, and, uh, you know, we're kind of at a point where we're like, maybe we just need to build a horse shaped car. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it needs some truck. You tried that. That was the thing that tried. Um, I, I would, I would mechanical horse. Oh, boy. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, benefit in familiarity. Someone kind of learning one new thing at a time, mapping it to their mental model, and then being like, but wait, now you can go stick your hand in and, and mess around with the graph, or you can do yeah. these different things. I don't know. I'll, I'll charge the listeners in the podcast a little bit, because I think some of this is by reference. And some of these things, the car to horse analogy, mm -hmm. is somebody has to say, I switched over, I have this outlook, it changed the way I think, you need to try it. It's this early adopter, early majority problem. And, and as, a, as a vendor, somebody writing the software, you, you can't do that for somebody else, right? Um, you know, this, we, were, we were talking to somebody, and they're like, yeah, the stuff you do is impossible. And we're like, no, it's no, impossible. It's, it, we're it's doing observability it. is the same thing. Yeah. And you, you sort of have, you can't, you can't say that. You have to have other people. And, and for startups especially, we need, Universally, startups need somebody to come in and say what they're doing has an impact, and then we have to help them make make that a small statement, so they're not spending an hour trying to explain what we do. Um, oh, yeah. But at the same time, it needs to be done by the people who sort of had the, taken that leap. Um, that doesn't absolve us from usability and things like that. Yeah. But I, we do need we need help from those power users to come back and say, 
you know, it's, it's like this. This is why I love conversations like this, because we can help sort of frame out um, where things are and why they're important. Um, we've done a really good job in this podcast. I want to start wrapping up. Yeah. Um, but we've done a really good job in this podcast of not saying charity majors. Yeah, I was just going to, I was just, no, but I was just going to say, we need to say who charity is just in case <laughs> someone doesn't know who's listening. And I was like, you kept saying charity. I'm like, oh, and that, that was on purpose. I in. wanted to focus on Honeycomb and you, yeah. and not, not on charity. Charity, charity ha- is, is a personality, capital P. Agreed. Uh, yeah, charity majors is a co-founder and a, uh, Ball of um, <laughs> unicorns <personality>. and kittens. <laughs> unicorns, kittens, and flaming, uh, flaming glasses of whiskey. On fire. Yeah, she's uh, a, a personality and a, um, a force of nature, and it has been so much fun to be in what feels like her world. Um, but but like having this, you know, I think of Honeycomb a lot as um, this. It's a result of this like great tension and balance between her and me, right? Between ops and dev, in this movement that we're trying to create, um, this 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 balance between someone who uh, loves crunching tons of data and analysis and, and graphs and and you know forensics, and someone who's like just no, let's ship it, let's get what we want. The purpose is uh, reliability, right? Like it's it's just a great balance of uh, personalities and motivations. We hope it can be seen in how honey, the, the path that Honeycomb has gone. Um, but, you know, again, back to people, you know, human Tetris in a team, everyone having their own strengths. Uh, the more I work with charity, the more I realize uh, the power in having someone to balance you out and be your counterpart and push when you pull um, or to pull when you push. And, and with that, you have greater force. And... I, this is this is something I think is very true. We see it, you know, in, in Racket and our team, um, where one person ends up being the face and the other person is is the balance, delivering, making sure everything works. Um, and the other person doesn't always get to sort of get seen as much. Um, and and I think you know it's it's awesome to be able to give you the spotlight, yeah. <laughs> some and, and and hear through how the vision gets made into the reality, how you you actually factor in what people want to do because you know. I think charity does an amazing job of having people say, go look at this, it's awesome, and it's observable, and, 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 and there's a whole bunch of you know things strung together with commas, uh, and that's great. And I, I love getting back in a, a clip down and saying, okay, this is how we're going to help people realize that vision. This is how we're going to deliver it. So um, I think that's been great. You're a fantastic team. I love what you've been doing. Thanks. Um, it's really neat to sit down and use the product. It really did only take us an hour to do a full integration. So super exciting. Um, that's really cool. <laughs> and actually, to, to explain those pieces very briefly, and then I guess we can wrap up. Literally, the benefit we got is you can take digital rebar and run it on your premises. Get every, you know, and if you're having issues or if you want to see what's happening, um, if you're having issues and you want to see what's happening, what you can do is you can download the Honeycomb plugin, put in your your key and it will start shipping logs from digital rebar into honeycomb and then you can expose it to the rack end team and we can actually observe what's going on see if we can help you make you know that type of very quick results getting high degrees of collaboration being able to actually start collecting data and logging it with minimal effort that's a really powerful statement right it's because these things were architected properly to (laughs) integrate with each other. A lot of Golang and Jason was it, was it, actually harmed in this in this demo. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll just say by the time this podcast that will come out, it'll be easy to find those plugins oh, from yeah, our those site and everything. Available. So we'll we'll make sure everyone knows where to go for that. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much. Christine, thank, well, Christine, thank, you. thank you for, for joining us. This was great. Uh, if people want more information, honeycomb.io. Yep. .io. Um, that's the best place. Any other places they should look? Our Twitter is great, honeycomb.io. Um, we, we tend to uh, post, we tend to have a lot of content on our blog um, that often will retweet relevant uh, articles in the, in the industry. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us live from yeah. SRE Con. And, and Robin, it's not often we do podcasts face to face, so you can see I don't <laughs> fall asleep during them and, uh, when, when we record them. Well, thanks again, everyone, for listening, and uh, we look forward to you listening to our future podcast. Thank you.